of Divinity, Masters of Calvary. We got Dina Davidson, Masters of Apologetics, Biola University. Dr. Craig Hazen, everyone, come on. Dr. Craig Hazen, who's in charge of the master's department, apologetics at Biola. He's also an incredible guy. He's been to a lot of our apologetics conferences. And then we happened to find out this guy didn't leave town yet because he's preaching this weekend. By the way, turn to your neighbor and say, you haven't been to church yet. This is a conference. You gotta come to church this weekend and hear Mark Clark. Mark, what are you gonna, first question, what are you gonna preach on this weekend? I don't know, you asked me to uh, preach on love, joy, and peace out of the fruit of the Spirit. Yes. And um, that's just a lot of stuff to cover because it's like gonna, gonna take a long time. Yes. So just get ready, it'll be an hour and a half at least just for the message, but anyways, yeah. We're gonna do- You'll be happy. One just stanza joking. of worship, no offering, no announcements, Hundred, mark yeah. for 90 minutes. Well, the way you guys do it, there's like three offerings before I'm even up. <laughs> we unleash right. the fashion around here. Right. Right. I'm kidding. You're the you best. You might have benefited from yeah. one of those offerings. <laughs> That's <Okay>. true. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. We got such a variety of questions here. We're going to just get right in it. And I'm going to go straight to uh, the smartest person on this panel, Dina Davidson. Dina, right. the first question is going to be for you. Um, why are the family trees in the Bible? If the Bible is meant to inspire us and it's all anointed for us, why did they put in that boring, pointless stuff? So it's, it's talking about all the... We have three or four of these questions uh, that are somehow like, hey, why do we got uh, the family trees? Or you could say also all those lists in the book of Numbers. Why is that stuff in the Bible, do you think, Dina? Yeah, I think everything is equally inspired. It's not equally helpful to us today when we're, you know, trying to parent a toddler. So I think we have to realize that the Bible was written to all of humanity. And so just because it doesn't necessarily apply to us, you know, it may not be important on our Tuesday or our Wednesday, but that doesn't mean it's not important in the scope of human history. God had an agenda. He wanted to communicate something. So I would say this is something I do. And I, I just finished reading through the Old Testament, which means a chapter a day. I was in Numbers for forever. And I was like, God, you are not speaking through Numbers. Like, not a single thing. And he was like, Dina, I have an agenda, you get on board my agenda. I don't come and meet your agenda. And so what I appreciated in reading through Numbers was just the fact that God has an agenda, okay? And I need to realize what that is. I think the point with Numbers is that people really matter to God, and so he had people keep records to indicate that, that God is intentional. And so that's something that we can draw from the book of Numbers, but whatever, whatever issue you, you come across and you're just asking that question, why would you include this God? Just worship the fact that we have an intentional God and he is communicating not just to you, not just to your neighbor, but to the entire span of human history. And maybe they needed it for some reason that you may not today. Okay, that's very good. Here's how this panel's gonna work. The experts are gonna give an answer and then I'm gonna tell you what they missed. I'm gonna add, <laughs> add to it. This just is like, classic. Just joking. The we're right gonna go, answer. We're gonna the go right, right answer to is. On that note, we're gonna go right to Jason Kane first, but I'm gonna ask all three other of our panel members to take a shot at this briefly. Uh, what is your top tips for personal Bible study? How do you read the Bible? How do you get into the Bible? So Jason, why don't we start with you? We'll go to Craig Hayes and then to Mark. Yeah, my top tip for studying the Bible is to study the Bible. That's very good. Yeah, I think uh, oftentimes, man, a lot of people talk about getting into a routine of studying the Bible, and you have to create some sort of habit. You need to study the Bible. One of my top tips is to do it daily, to do it daily. The only way that you can hide God's word in your heart is to have a daily practice of getting into the word. If you want to work out, get in the gym, you want to get healthy, you want to get fit, you can't just go once a week and expect to get the results that you want. It has to be a daily practice, and we have to make sure we do the same thing as we study God's word. There you go. Dr. Hazen, yeah. Uh, yeah, do it, do it every day, no doubt about that. But here's something else. I don't know that you can just gin this up on your own, but uh, you can ask God to help you with it. And that is just, God, help, help me to understand exactly what it means that you have given us this amazing gift of your word that will guide me day in and day out through all the very difficult times of my life and through the great joys of my life. Because once you start nailing that, you go, Wow, how would I ever miss this? You know, I am not, 
a very spiritual guy. I'm not the guy people run to, you know, hey, Craig, would you pray for me? You know, uh, <laughs> hey, uh, I love to pray and I love to pray for people, but, uh, and, and people wouldn't expect me to be the guy who really cracks open the Bible every morning in my private room, in my, my Bible reading chair. But man, I wouldn't miss it. It, it's just so invigorating every day. I learn something new, and I realize it's something eternal and wonderful. And uh, I didn't always feel like that, but that's just where I am with the scriptures right now. I wouldn't miss it. Um, yeah, I, I would say uh, do do stuff that is, like, um, accessible and attainable for you. So, you know, oftentimes people, you know, get to the new year. You know, we just kind of flipped over the new year, and they go, okay, I'm going to read the Bible in a year. And we all know, like, that... You know, by about, you know, February 1st, when you're in the midst of some boring thing, you're like, gosh, just shoot me now. Um, so uh, so then we don't end up doing it, and we just give up. So don't do that. Like, do something that you can actually, like to Jason's analogy about working out, which clearly I do every day. Um, oh, you know, it's like... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, it's... It's like you got to do something you can actually accomplish to get momentum in your life, right? Like when you accomplish it, then you get jacked about it, then you keep going. So for some of you, it's going to be like, hey, I can do a chapter a day. Like, and that's what you do. And it's, and, and you just pour into that and then you start getting excited about it. I remember um, in Bible college, I actually got this assignment that I had to read the whole book of Genesis in a week. And I remember reading all of Genesis in three sittings. And it's actually brilliant. Like, I don't know how many of you have, like, watched Breaking Bad, you know, the show. And if you have, you probably wouldn't tell anybody. But it's like <laughs> reading Genesis in three sittings is like watching Breaking Bad. Like, you are on the edge of your seat. There's guys getting raped. There's all kinds of... And you're like, what's going on? What's going to happen next? Like, it can be drama. It doesn't have to be dry and boring. Um, but just make sure that you do something that's attainable. And it's like, hey, I did that chapter. Awesome. I look forward to the next chapter. Do something that you can get momentum versus giving yourself a goal that you're never going to accomplish and you're going to get discouraged pretty quick. So Love it. I love yeah. it. Uh, the beauty about this time and age is that we live in a time where there is more Bible scholarship accessible to you than ever, ever before. So, you know, don't be, my advice on this is when you're reading, don't be afraid to ask contextual questions. What, what makes the Bible boring is if you come into the middle of a physics class. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Come into the middle of a physics class, you're lost. If you start off by going, who wrote this? Why did they write it? Who is he writing it to? Why are they writing? And the answers to those questions are more readily available than others. Once you get a little of the context, then you know why the prophets are yelling at people so hard. If you don't know why they're yelling at them, it's just depressing. Okay, God's gonna punish. He's gonna punish. Next chapter, more punishment. You gotta know why it's happening. Get the context. Okay, uh, uh, Dina, I'm gonna go back to you. Uh, why did God create humans? Okay. There's a variety of this sort of question. I'm summarizing it all. And yeah. What in the world? Did, why did he create humans? Just so he could Did he know what he was or? doing? Because it's kind yes, of a situation yeah. now. Why did God create humans? Honestly, I don't think, maybe Pastor Mark or Craig or Jason can uh, correct me on this one. I don't think the Bible answers that question. And I think this is an important point for us where the Bible says don't go beyond what is written. We can theorize, but a lot of our theories could end up in heresy, like I don't know, maybe God was lonely. Okay, well, actually, God is Trinity, which means he has always been in a relationship with himself. So he's never been lonely, and so, you know, that's not it. So I think it's really important. We can have this question, and we can even have a conversation with God about it, but let's make sure that as we're reading Scripture, we can let God answer our question, questions through Scripture, Scripture but we shouldn't turn the pages of scripture to make sure that God answers our questions because there are Wait, 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 Dina, say that again. Say that again, that was very good. We can ask God questions and allow him to use scripture to answer those questions, but we should not turn the pages of scripture for God to answer our questions because the Bible is so clear that some things are revealed and some things are hidden which means when we meet our Savior, when we meet the omniscient God face-to-face, -face, we get to ask him all of those questions. But there will be some questions that are unanswered. And I think that's one of the questions that the Bible just doesn't specifically speak to. Now, 
you can correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I'm going to ask That's a follow-up okay. question to Dr. Hazen because, Dr. Hazen, your background, you're, you're an expert in Mormonism, uh, by the way. You're an expert in uh, apologetics. Uh, one time on stage during an apologetics conference, to spice things up, I made Dr. Hazen answer the question of evil after breathing in helium. It was great. And he did a really good job. Underneath this question, why did God create humans, is why are we subjected to this suffering and even eternal suffering? So can you give us a little bit, what's your view on the Bible and suffering? Why is brokenness, hurt, harm, heartache, why is that a part of this life and even in eternity? Yeah, you know, as a, as a seasoned apologetics professor, here's, you have to watch out for questions like this, mm. right? In fact, there's a, it's a particular species of question. It's a, it's a why would God question. Mm. And you have to put that in context. Here's a being who can speak billions of galaxies into existence. And we're going to sit down here and we're going to speculate on why he did this, that, or the other thing. You know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, he, he actually doesn't mind us speculating about those things, but as long as you start out with the proper context, I like to start out with the answer, I haven't the foggiest idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, we can speculate a little bit why he would do this. I mean, God is so full of love. He not only wanted to share it with his partners in the Trinity, he wanted to actually share it with human beings made in his image. And the only way to make that really happen is to give humans freedom so that they can choose to love one another and they can choose to love him. The problem is you give them that kind of freedom and they can abuse it. Every one of us is capable of going our own way, shaking our fist at God and forgetting the whole mess. And guess what? He's God who can speak a billion galaxies into existence. He's going to give you every opportunity, but he's not going to force you to do it. He loves you and he, he'll woo you until the cows come home. He just can't wait to have a relationship with you. That's just the kind of God he is. And he will have a group of people who really love him and who, who share his glory and his love for all eternity. And I gotta tell you, I wanna be part of that mix. And I want you to be there too. There you go. To, to hop onto that, something amazing I learned in one of my classes, um, Why Does God Allow Evil? Is one, our professor said, I think every page of scripture was written to answer that question. Why would God allow evil? And as I read scripture, I think that is a fair question to ask. I think equally fair as you're turning the pages of scripture is to ask the question, because God certainly is, why would humans choose evil? So there is the question, why would God allow it? But equally valid when we are approaching scripture is that question of, why would human beings, given the goodness of God, all of the ways he set them up for success, why would they choose evil? evil, and then the ultimate question, which one will you choose? Okay, yeah, very good. Come on, you can give it up for that. That's very, very good. All right, let's get into it now. Take another level, Debo. Of all the questions I got, and I got some 50 questions on here, and I got another 40 in my pocket or 30 in my pocket from the youth seminar earlier today. Of all the questions we've received, what category of question do you think was asked the most? I'm asking that. You got to answer the panel. What? End times is wrong. You're really wrong. Very wrong. <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone else? Want to try? Am I really saved? Am I really saved? No. Also wrong. Come on, guys. She answered, yes, you are. <laughs> no, it's about sex. Sex. So many sex questions. You are all so interested in sex. Sex, 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 the Bible, sex, sex, the Bible, age of the Bible, sex, sex, sex. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, instead of asking 40 sex questions in a row, I'm just gonna ask Mark Clark, what about sex? <laughs> Give it, you said something so interesting last night, I thought it was powerful, and if you weren't here last night, go back and listen to it. He said, how many would have guessed, did you say 10 years ago or a generation ago, that one of the most controversial verses in the Bible would be Genesis 1-1? Yeah. He created them male and female. So, in this culture where we want to be missional, kind, compassionate, and uncompromising of truth, uh, coaches, Pastor Mark, pastors, Pastor Mark, how do we handle this issue of sex, homosexuality, transgender roles, uh, Me Too, all of that stuff? You got, you got 30 seconds. Which one? You got like 30 that? seconds. Um, 
Okay, well, to be honest, I mean, I, I can't do it in, in that amount of time because you can't new one. You're going to say something that's going to end up in the internet or something. So, um, uh, <laughs> speaking of getting canceled, um, <laughs> so I, I literally wrote a whole chapter. The longest chapter in, uh, this isn't a, a ploy to sell books, but I'm just telling you for content-wise, in The Problem of God, a book I wrote in 2017, apologetics book, it, the longest chapter is on sex. And so, uh, which is funny because in most apologetics books, you know, apologetics, of course, means a defense of the faith and people who are trying to defend the faith in the world. And um, most of them don't deal with sex. Like, but as I talk to people in Vancouver, it's like, it's like one of the main reasons they won't want to become a Christian. Because, you know, the Christian ethic is too conservative. It's like male, female, the context of marriage. Don't you want to do all these other things? Don't you want to, you know, explore? And it was one of the big questions I had to deal with when becoming a Christian, you know, late in my teen years. So, um, there's an entire chapter on sexuality, but I guess just to hone in on this for a second, I think one of the things that, at least as I talk to people in my church, it's like one of the reasons people don't want to become Christians is because they think that God is anti-sex. And we get that from this history of like, uh, you know, Mary was a virgin when she had Jesus, and therefore sex is bad, and you're supposed to do it with the lights off and do it in, you know, one position and just do it to have kids or whatever, and and we're like, well, that, none of that sounds fun, and none of my buddies are doing that. So, uh, but what you got to realize is, sexuality isn't just for procreation; it's for pleasure, it's for protection. Um, and you know, First Corinthians talks a lot about like to keep yourself from Satan. You got to make sure that you're having it in a you know constantly when you're a married couple, and you got to make sure you're exploring and having pleasure and talking and communicating and not just assuming things about sexuality. Uh, and so it's like this whole world of making sure that Christians are actually having a great sex life in order to reflect that out to the world because the reality is, is that God has used the pleasure of sexuality evangelistically. He is saying this pleasure that you get, which might be the greatest pleasure on earth, it's like a little piece of what heaven's gonna look like. Like I give you a little piece, a little like grass through the concrete and you guys grab a hold of it and you're like, this is all I want in life. It's like, no, 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 that's, that's nothing. That's a pointer to the kind of pleasure that you're going to experience delight forevermore, the Psalms talk about. So when you're sitting with your buddy and you're like, you like sex, then don't go to hell. <laughs> you should receive Jesus and get the kind of delight and pleasure forevermore that sex is just a pointer to. I mean, you're a scholar in Mormonism. That's what the half the religion's about, right? Like just planetary sex forever, all right? And I'm not saying that's what it is. I'm just saying, I'm saying Christianity does a poor job in presenting this because we sit around and we, we picture heaven as this apple store of just white nonsense. It's just boring. And then other religions like Islam have like, you're going to go get virgins. And you wonder why men are into Islam and Mormonism and not Christianity. <laughs> it's like planetary wives, virgins, or singing forever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I don't know. That's my answer. I don't know. All right. Gonna, you you yeah. asked. Oh, that was great. Talk about it. That was great. Yeah. You, you took you a minute to warm up, but then you got going. That was good, Dr. Craig. So, just a a brief word on the the modern challenge of uh, homosexual practice. It's just such a difficult issue in the church. Uh, I just want to share something that the the Lord taught me a number of years ago. Uh, my oldest brother's gay, and we have a great relationship. He knows where I stand. I know where he stands, and we love each other and, and interact with each other all the time anyway. So we've not let it be any kind of barrier. But I remember when I was in grad school up in Santa Barbara, and I was driving down to Orange County with my wife where my mother-in-law lives. And uh, we thought, hey, let's stop by Steve's house, you know, just say hi. So we pull in in West Los Angeles. We, we go up to his place, and uh, cars everywhere. Well, it turned out that, that was, uh, there was an afterglow party going on in his house because they just had the gay pride parade. It wasn't on my calendar. Um, 
after we pull up and we, we go into the house and it's just jammed full of people and my brother sees me, he goes, hey everybody, it's my fundamentalist brother from Orange County. Uh, I gotta tell you, being from Orange County was more provocative than being a fundamentalist. That's interesting, that's interesting. But because I was on their turf, I found it unusually, they, uh, the, just the people attending the party would come and go, so tell me, what, what is it you, why do you have such a problem with our lifestyle? What's that all about? And I go, well, you know, if you ask me, Craig Hazen, man of the world, you know, if I'm just kind of trying to figure it out on my own, I go, I wouldn't have any problem with the lifestyle, you know? And say, so well, well, wait, well, then what's, am I misinformed? What's the issue here? I go, well, you know, maybe there's more going on. I say, so let me, let me ask you a question. Um, uh, if, if there is a God, and if that God has spoken to human beings about things like human sexual practices, would that make a difference to you? And I remember this one guy, the other people are starting to gather for the conversation now, by the way. And, and, and he's like, oh, well, he's hemming and hawing. And I go, no, 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 just humor me. It's a hypothetical. If there is a God, and if that God had some important things to communicate about human sexual practices, would that make a difference, you know? One more round. He hemmed and hawed. I go, okay, you know, look, come on. If, if, if there is a God, it's a hypothetical, and that God has spoken about these things, would it make a difference? And uh, he goes, yeah, I guess I'd have to pay attention to what that God had to say. I go, well, that's the real question. You see, so I move, and I think this is totally directed by God, moved it from that really hot button issue to the issue that stands a chance of really making a difference in that situation. Uh, and so, you know, is there a God and has that God actually communicated about this? Because once you come into, into the presence of God with your sin, it's a different ballgame. Uh, by the way, by, by the time we were done and, and I, was, I was fielding questions from the people, we were in a sunken living room. Remember those? And I'm standing up on like a little fireplace hearth answering questions. My brother walks around the corner from the kitchen, looks in there and goes, oh. Why did I let him in, you know? <laughs> On my way out, some guy stopped me and goes, you know what, I gotta tell you, uh, you fundamentalists have kind of a bad rap because, I mean, you have some pretty good questions and, uh, you know, I don't think you're gonna change my mind, but you guys have something going. Mm. So, that's about as, as good as it's ever gotten, but uh, just a little story to help. Is there a God and has that God, does that God have something to say about human sexual practices? It's very good, it's very good. Uh, Dina or Jason, you want to jump in on this one at all before we move to another? Oh, no, let's keep going. <laughs> they covered it well. They did cover it well. There's, a, I just let me say from a past world, there's a plethora of questions in here that are of the form, uh, will God accept me if, does God hate my? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that question. It's a, it's a much more complicated question than it's, that it's stated, by the way. Uh, but... If you're saying that God has a particular hate for one particular type of, type of sexual sin and not another particular type of sexual sin, I would say that that was an error. And if you were saying that God wants us to do exactly what Dr. Craig Hazen just modeled there, which is have civil, reasonable dialogue with people without bringing any of our sort of uh, uh, political or personal angst into it, and just loving people well and having reasonable answers to them, that's the right response to both your friend or your relative or you as a person. If you're in here today and you say, man, I have a disagreement with you, we wanna with gentleness and respect have civil dialogue. Um, back in the day, we had this big, huge uproar at UC Davis when I was there and uh, all the LGBTQ community and all the Christian clubs got in one room and yelled at each other for about five hours. And finally, this kid stood up. He said, this kid in the middle of the room, he stood up and he said, he's a Christian kid. He said, this isn't right. He goes, we're the future leaders of America in here. This isn't right. We're, our country's gonna go nowhere if we keep this dialogue. He goes, I, I don't know if I agree with everything that got said here, but I'll tell you what. Does anyone wanna play soccer with me tomorrow at four? And the head of the LGBTQ community stood up and he goes, I'll play soccer with you. I love soccer. Well, let's start with soccer. And then we'll tell our stories to each other and listen to each other. And so they started playing soccer together. We need a let's start with soccer movement in America. Amen? Amen. All, right, all right. I'm going to go to Jason Kane, yep. uh, Master's of Counseling. 
There's so much fear and anxiety. We prayed about it last night. Uh, There's several questions in here that are of the form of how do you handle the political strife? It's giving me so much anxiety. There's division in our culture racially. There's division over the uh, actual COVID. Then there's actually just the personal thing. Like, like, you know, uh, some people that have not gotten the vaccine have been demonized. I know people are just like, Kurt, I... I'm just paralyzed with fear, and I can't even really actually un- under- explain it. I know other people that have gotten the vaccine, and they're like, I'm paralyzed with fear. It hasn't helped. Speak to us as a pastor and counselor, Jason. How do we carry the intensity of anxiety in this cultural moment? How does the Bible help us in that way? Yeah, absolutely. I think Jesus really teaches us the way of how to deal with people who are on opposite ends of the spectrum. And I think Jesus tells us to engage people with grace and truth, and unfortunately, the church has not always done that well, which goes back to the last discussion that we were having, that when we've been so, uh, our, when, we've, when we've been viewed as being hostile toward specific communities, then it has caused them to respond in hostility. But I think if we act out as we are doing right now, going through a series on the fruits of the Spirit, that if we display the fruits of the Spirit of the world, that is going to help us to engage people at a place that allows them to hear what we have to say. Uh, on the variety of divisive issues that are happening in our, in our country and in the world, racial issues, COVID, all sorts of other things that have happened, the, one of the saddest things that I've seen as a pastor are the relationships that people have lost because people stand on the opposite end of them on an issue that doesn't have anything to do with who Jesus is and who Jesus loves. And I think... And while those things are important and while we are dogmatic about them in so many different ways and while people view uh, their side of things as the only way to to live, I think what's important is for us to sit down and see the humanity in people so that we can have dialogue because when we just stand and shout at each other on social media and in other, other places, it doesn't do anything for our Christian witness. How much damage has happened to our Christian witness over the past two years because of how we've dealt with people. And I think if we look back at this moment, we'll see, man, we lost so much Mm. influence, not because of what we said about Jesus, but what we said about a peripheral issue that really we won't even be thinking about beyond this. That's so good, Jason. Uh, Just one quick follow-up. Help me, my friend, my daughter, uh, my high school friend, my daughter, my husband, my coworker, is they've just gone through everything you just described and they are dealing with anxiety for the first time uh, in their life. How do I help my friend who's having panic attacks, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, just more fearful? Uh, what's, your, what's your pastoral advice to Yeah, us? all of us, I believe, are, are living in a, a fearful time. And if we're all honest, it's difficult to know what's true and what's not true, if we're being frank. Mm. No matter where, what news station you watch, no matter what you read, all of us are dealing, it feels like, like we're, we're living in the fog. And there is certainly fear when we cannot see what is happening around us. Um, for individuals that are living with anxiety, the first thing I would say is for a long time, unfortunately, we've treated anxiety as if, if somebody was having anxiety that they were living in sin. And that simply is not the case. I mean, Jesus, for crying out loud before he goes across, is sitting in the Garden of Gethsemane praying. And he's praying with such intensity. And he has this, this crisis moment that drops of blood are coming out of his pores. Listen, anxiety is not a sin. And I think because we have this scripture that says, be anxious for nothing, people don't read it in its context and understand what's being said. They believe it's a sinful thing. That's not the case. And I think if you have somebody who is dealing with anxiety, and I have somebody in my life who's close to me that is dealing with anxiety, I think what you do is draw close to them, and you be there, and you support them. But the last thing that you should tell them is, stop worrying. Mm. That is not helpful. I think being there for them and loving them and talking with them through their issues will go a whole lot further than you just saying, stop worrying. Really, what stop worrying is saying to the individual is, I don't want to hold this problem with you. Mm. When you draw near to them, you're holding it with them. All right. All my relational people are happy with the sex and anxiety questions. I'm going to go back to a technical question. Uh, Dina, Dr. Craig, Mark, anyone you want to jump in? Um, I'll let someone pick this. How, what is the role of polygamy in the Old Testament, and how did the nation of Israel go from polygamy to monogamy? Uh, hey, you know, so, uh, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 in all seriousness. 
Mark wrote about this in one of his books. It gives a fantastic answer. I think you should talk about this one. <laughs> Which book was that, Jason? That was the a... Problem of Polygamy. Uh, yeah. The, oh, problem the Problem of Polygamy. On yes. sale now. No, Looking yeah, for it yeah. on Amazon. <laughs> By the way, do you really work out or just no. shop in the preteen t shirt section Gosh. at Costco? <laughs> no, stay. Stay. Kevin Thompson texted me to say I'm that to kidding. you. Okay, polygamy, polygamy, uh, polygamy. Let's go. I, I don't know, man. Man, there's a bunch a, of. I talked about relevant. this yesterday, like in the sense of like there was stuff in the Old Testament era and epoch that is different than the stuff in the New Testament. The, the, the Jesus cross and the coming of the Spirit. That's the change. Read Acts 10. Read Acts 15. The whole thing is. Oh my gosh, we're Jews, and and this Jesus and the coming of the Spirit, God, it changed everything. We don't have to do half of this stuff anymore, and we're going to do this because the Gentiles are included. So there were times where polygamy is a thing. But here's the thing: um, just be listen. Okay, so when you're reading the Bible, it's a very important principle. There are things that are descriptive, and there are things that are prescriptive. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between those two things. So when you're reading a Bible passage and it's like, hey, this guy put a cloak out and he asked what the will of God was and then God showed up and, and then you go, I think I should do that with my life. And you start looking in your fruit loops for God to tell you who you're supposed to marry. That is not what the Bible's telling you to do. It happened to one guy once. Knock Gideon. it off. Gideon. It's descriptive. It's just telling you what happened. It's not saying this is what God wants. And so when David's out sleeping with everybody under the sun and Abraham selling out wives and trading them out, you're not reading that and your devo's going, I got to be like Abraham. I should do this with my life. It's what happened. But it's not God saying, now I'm going to prescribe it to your life. It's descriptive, not prescriptive. And there's a million texts like that in the Bible. And so you got to read them in context and go, okay, this is, God is just explaining what happened. And if you read Genesis, you're going to realize, this is what Robert Alter talks about, I think this is what you're referring to, is that he's this Old Testament scholar, and he says, listen, the people who are having multiple wives, even though you can't find a verse that says don't do this, they're having a terrible time of life. Mm. And so you're supposed to mm. read the theology of the Bible sometimes in a narrative way and go, oh, he's actually telling me some stuff without telling me. If I read Genesis, everybody who's got multiple wives hates their lives. It's terrible. <laughs> and you're supposed to go, oh, okay, this is actually upending this entire ancient Near Eastern way of living. And God is saying, I have a better way of being human. And so that's the way you're supposed to kind of answer that question. So no, polygamy is a, a, a no. And I told you guys about this yesterday. There was a guy meeting with me. He just wants it. He's just like, you know what? Multiple women sounds great. Can I do the concubine thing? I'm like, gosh, am, I'm just an awful communicator if you've been sitting in my church for five years and you think you can have concubines, you moron. How do you really feel? upset about the whole children's t-shirt comment <laughs> earlier to be honest you should still be still reeling with that that was unnecessary bit. that was not was kind kidding. or christ-like it was right. fun it's fine but um <laughs> dina all right dina works with our thrive college everyone say thrive, thrive college uh, so dina i'm coming to the bible and i'm using it to find my vocation my purpose and my future lots of people especially right now in covid they're unmoored they don't know their direction they're trying to figure out the next step is the bible something useful for finding my purpose and future and if so what are the right and wrong ways to do that that's a great question and I wish that's where people would start when they were asking those mm. vocational questions, the questions about, should I leave my church? Should I leave my family, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they shouldn't start from the place of what do I feel and what do I want, which is where we often start from. So I think, I think the Bible is incredibly useful. I think whatever problem we have, it didn't break, right? Nope. <laughs> um, I think whatever question that we have, I think scripture speaks to it. It may not give us the exact answer. It may not tell us you should take this job instead of that job. First and foremost, the Bible speaks really clearly about what the general calling is on the human life. This is in Genesis 1 and 2. We are, we are called to partner with each other to steward the earth. That is a job that God has given us. We are called to be fruitful and to multiply, to fill the earth 
we have been given this earth as something that we are to cultivate. And, and cultivate doesn't mean just let's go garden. Thank the Lord, because I am terrible at gardening. It also means to create beautiful works of art. It means whatever gift that God has given you, to take that gift and work with all your might to grow that gift so that when you meet him face to face, you can say, this is what I did with what you gave me to make the world more true, good, and beautiful. That is the general calling that we have on our life. Then we also have the specific calling. We have been appointed to this time in history. You see, we have inherited the problem of the pandemic, this pandemic. We have inherited the political division. We have inherited the greatest generational loss in Christianity that has ever happened in recorded human history. That is on our watch. And that means that because we are born into this time and we have come to faith, that we have been given a calling to do something to bring God's kingdom from heaven into this very earthly broken moment. So you're like, so what job should I take? I don't know, but I do know that all of that which is spoken of so clearly in scripture should inform our every decision. It should inform our decision about what job to take. It should inform our decision about what college to go to or not to go to college. It should inform our decision about how to parent our kids and whether to send them to this school or that school. So I think the right way in general is to take the big questions and prayerfully think through those big questions. The wrong way is to start with the small questions of, you know, what job should I take? What college should I go to? If you're asking the small questions and that's dominating your prayer life, you're thinking too small. You have been given a calling from God to this moment in human history. He has works that he has prepared in advance for you to do. Let's get on those works. That's great. Hey Amen, well said. Big questions. Big question, yeah. Can I add to that? Yeah, 100%. I think, I think the point you're making is really important, and I just want to say that, like, I think we live in a time where, unfortunately, people are hopeless, and Christianity is feeding hopelessness, which is very bizarre, because with what you're talking about, you're never going to want to hone into your gifting, your identity, and say, I'm going to use it to advance the kingdom of God. If your basic theological hermeneutic is, well, the world's over in 15 minutes, let's all just pack it in and be hopeless. The job of the prophet throughout prophetic literature is to offer two things, prophetic critique and prophetic hope. And we're really good at critique. Mm. The world's ending, everything's crap, it's terrible, it's evil, it's suffering, the world, let's all be miserable and depressed. And it's like, no, no, the prophets stood up and went, yeah, Babylon's a mess, the empires of the world are a mess, but Yahweh is in control. And if you're dragging your life around, thinking it's all over, I can't, like I literally have people that I know that are like, well, you know, it's all over by March anyway, so you might as well, like, I'm like, hey, th wow. give me your money. <laughs> Canada, it's March, we're it's February March. here in the it's States. It's like, what do you guys say? Like the non-Christians around you are looking to you for hope. Come on. They're looking to you going, what am I supposed to do with my life? I am a mess. And you're supposed to shine out and go, look, Jesus is actually hopeful. You're supposed to say, yes, there's criticism. Yes, there's sin. But there's also hope to be had in the world. And you're supposed to line up your gifting and your passions and your talents to line up with moving the kingdom of God forward in regard to hope and not depression. That's our role in the world. So, Amen. Amen. All right, final question. You guys, give yourself a round of applause. You ask great questions. This is the winning question. When I read it, I knew it was gonna be my final question. Uh, we got a bunch of youth in the room. This is especially dedicated to you guys. Uh, Megan Fate Marshman is gonna be in your seminar, youth, uh, tomorrow. Don't miss that. And we're gonna talk more about tomorrow in a second. But I want the whole panel to give me, uh, the question as it was stated in the text was, where will the church be in five years? Here's how I'd ask it even more specifically, and I want each panel member to give me a brief answer. Make one warning and one encouragement. One warning to the church for five years from now and one encouragement to the church for five years from now. And I'll let whoever wants to go first, go first. Cool, I'll start with uh, the encouragement. Man, one of the greatest promises that we have in scripture 
is that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. The gospel has lasted and outlasted every empire from the time that Jesus died till this day today. And trust me, there have been other difficult times in history, but the promise that we can hold on to is that the church is not going anywhere at all. God always has a plan for his people, and the redeemed people of the world will always be here, and the gospel is not going anywhere. Now, the warning for all of us is to make sure that we tether our lives to the true gospel of Jesus Christ and not anything else. Mm. Because while we've seen an exodus of people leaving the church, what we have to be careful is to make sure that our churches are aligned with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the churches that continue to keep Christ first, to keep his word first, will be the ones that will be around because those are the ones that were given the promise. I once heard it said that every generation has the seeds of the church's demise and the seeds of the church's revival. Mm. And every single generation gets to choose what seeds to sow. And you can, you can read about church history and you can see this. You can see that there were some generations that, that sowed to demise. And, and God brought the church back because that's what God does. He resurrects dead things. He resurrects bad things. He, he transforms the human heart. But here's the thing, in my generation, I want to sow the seeds of revival. I want people to look back on Dina Davidson's lifeline and say she was part of God resurrecting the church. So I am hoping and I am praying that the church's darkest days in my lifetime are past and that the future is simply brighter and brighter. But here is my encouragement and my um, what critique. Warning. My critique, I'll start with that, is that we are hyper-Protestants, which means that every time we disagree, we leave. And that is one of the worst legacies of Protestantism. And I am a Protestant, and I, there is so much to steward and to love about the Protestant movement. But one of the negative legacies is that every time we disagree, we split. And Jesus said that we, he wanted us to be unified, He said, you will know them by their love for each other. And so my encouragement is if you're going to be one of the people that sows the seeds of the church's revival, then I think you need to have a staying spirit. Mm. Stay unless God tells you to leave, unless there is heresy and you need to break with that heresy, unless you cannot use your gifts in your church Have a staying spirit and figure out how to correct the wrongs and the evils in your church because it could be that God called you to church not to leave when you disagree, but to change it. And that's what I believe we need to do. Amen. Try to beat that, Dr. Hazen. (laughs) Uh, So I I have, I don't know if it's an advantage or a disadvantage. I get a chance to travel a lot to different churches and see what's going on in these churches. And I got to tell you, I mean, you don't, you don't get this story on CNN or network news or even on Fox News or anything else, but there is a very vibrant bunch of Jesus-loving, Bible-reading, God-serving Christians out there. A lot of them. And I've been thinking a lot about this. I wrote a book a couple of years ago on prayer, and it, it focuses on John chapter 15, verse 7. Get, get what this says. Uh, if you abide in me... And my words abide in you. Ask for anything, and it will be done for you. And I'll bet most of us don't believe that. that that's what set me off on the research project. You know, I, don't, I didn't believe that, and the Holy Spirit was telling me that, so I decided to start researching it. So again, if, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, maybe that it's that double conditional before the glory, Right? Uh, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Maybe we're not doing the abiding properly. Mm. So I explored that. I thought maybe that's the main reason. But as I traveled around to the various churches and I meet the leaders, 
and the lay people and their love for Jesus. I mean, these people are sold out, and I know you are too. You are the kind of people who are uh, abiding in him, and his words are abiding in you. You read the Bible regularly. You read it to your kids. You read it to your grandkids. You're the kind of people who attend things like this, for goodness sakes. It's a very nice evening. You could be doing many other things, but here you are doing this. That's a sign that you are really on track and serving him and abiding in him. To abide in him basically means to be at home with. And I sense you are at home with him. So that you fulfilled the conditional. So guess what? If you, and there's a context to this passage, you want to be doing his work. If you want to do his kingdom work, if you want to push it forward, if you want to bear his fruit, which is what the passage is all about, you can take this to the bank. You can ask for anything, and he will give it to you. I think that's a sign of great hope if we start to understand that Jesus really meant that. And he told that lesson to his disciples hours before his death. That's how important it was. He saved it up to deliver that important message. I know we've been robbed of that basic idea, maybe from the prosperity gospel or the word faith movement, whatever you want to call it. We're, we're actually afraid to go there. We ought to reclaim that because it's something that Christians have, have just clung to throughout the ages, and we need to get back to that. He is here. The devil desperately wants us not to understand that verse, but it really is for us. If you abide in him, and his words abide in you, and you want to you wanna bear his fruit, move his kingdom forward, you can take it to the bank, ask for anything, and he will do it. Wow. Um, yeah, just to add, add to what these guys have said. So uh, here's, here's my encouragement. I, I think that um, one of the things we all got to understand, and whether that's understanding... Um, something over the last two years or just understanding through church history. Guys, the way that Christianity flourishes yeah. is not when it goes after power. Mm. Listen, you look geographically through history. Most religions are still housed out of the cultures they were birthed out of, okay? Okay. If you look at Islam, it's mostly Middle Eastern. If you look at Buddhism, it's mostly Asian. If you look at, you go through all the religions, you still have massive populations that still exist geographically in those things. Christianity, though, began Jewish, moved to the Roman Empire, and then it moved to Europe. It moved from Europe across to North America, and it has now moved to Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Christianity has never grown faster in the history of time. Listen to me. Because what you're going to hear is like, oh, everything's so bad and the world's so bad. Guys, do you want to have a baby a hundred years ago? Go to the dentist in, eight, in the 1800s and see how bad your life is now. <laughs> Guys, the kingdom of God is coming. Amen. So listen. There has never been a move of the Holy Spirit more powerful than in this moment right now in China as we sit here right now. But Christianity moved from North America to Latin America where 3,000 people come to Christ today, Asia and Africa. You know why? Because when Christianity gets power, it dies. Here's where it thrives, on the margins. Mm where nobody have anything. We're talking about Jesus who gave up power and came down. The ultimate influence is on the margins. So if we're gonna have hope going forward, it's to recognize it's not about going after worldly power or influence at all. It's about recognizing our identity in Jesus, understanding that when the Holy Spirit moves, we gotta catch up with it, and it moves among people with no power. Amen. Amen. That's the hope I give. The warning I give is what I said yesterday, which is one generation believes something, the next generation assumes it, the next generation denies it, so don't assume it. Believe it, teach it, teach it, meditate on it, be super intentional about it so that the next generation doesn't assume it and deny it going forward. Can we give it up for our panel? And now, I'm going to answer the question better than they did. Uh, because 
I am the number one teacher on the issue of humility in America. Right. Here's, my, here's my thing, this is my real answer to this and, it's, and, it, and it adds to everything said. Uh, my warning is preference. Preference. If you seek preference, the, the point Jason made about the church prevailing, that will be the church of Africa and China, not the American church. It'll prevail, just will be in the southern hemisphere. Preference isolates you and depresses you. Getting your way is the worst way. That's my warning. We live in a hyper-preference culture. Here's my encouragement. If we love each other well, I'm talking about Christians loving Christians, the world will be jealous till they get saved. Yeah, that's good. If we love each other well, everything will be fine. To what Dina said, we can't be Protestants that protest everything. We've gotta love each other well, and if we do that, they'll be provoked to jealousy because the world is very lonely, isolated, broken, depressed. So we gotta love each other well, amen? Amen. Good night, everyone. God bless. Great job.